Please be seated. Let's pray. Father, our desire is to set our sights upon you. To do the soul work and heart work and mind work of looking where we have made you second or worse and put you above all else in our hearts. Father, we lament that this happens in our flesh and in this body that is very weak. But we worship you and we are amazed that we actually can be concerned about these things now by your grace and by your spirits indwelling who reminds us and convicts us how easy it is for us to not give you the first place in everything. And Father, we do long for the day for when all of the promises that you have made to us in salvation actually come to pass and we will forever be in your presence and there will be no more displacing you to second or third position or last. But because we believe and trust Jesus Christ and because of your amazing promises to us in the gospel, we will make it all the way there. You will sustain us. And so, Father, we find ourselves together today as a, as a church family, and we want to, in this day and in this season, you have us in here to get a glimpse, a better glimpse, a more clear glimpse of you in the word of God, which reveals you. So would you draw near to us now as we draw near to you and bless our pursuit of you and our study of you in the word of God. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's take our Bibles this morning and we're gonna turn back to the book of Romans this morning. So grateful for Josh's pastoral leadership. Um, the last five Sundays through Jonah, how great that was. Um, and encouraging that minor prophet came alive in my own heart, I know for you as well. So thank you, Josh, for that. And um, we have been going through Romans. That's been the primary thing that we've been about in our study together. And so we're going to step back into it. And what we've been doing periodically is we've been reviewing before we go into the next major section. So I just want to remind you a little bit about this great letter that Paul wrote to the believers in Rome. Really, the gospel of Jesus Christ is uniquely unfolded and unveiled in Paul's letter to the Roman believers. It's, it's uniquely unfolded there. In this one location in your Bible, in this one letter, is gospel riches and gospel treasures and gospel beauty beyond measurement. It is the longest treatment of the gospel in any one letter in your New Testament. And that length sometimes can be very intimidating. Uh, you can feel like you walked into the edge of the woods, went a little bit in, and now you're lost, and you're not really sure what the whole thing's about anymore. <laughs> so what we've been doing is we've been trying to divide it up into smaller subsections along the way, and, and hopefully that can help us follow Paul's gospel argument a little better. And if we can then tie those little subsections back into the, what, what the purpose of the whole letter is, we can get the main thrust of the letter. We have a better chance to not get lost along the way and understand the whole. So that's what we're doing. We're pausing along the way after each main section in Romans to review it, to get the bigger picture, and see where we've been. And hopefully this is helpful for all of you, but especially for those of you who maybe have joined our study only recently. Maybe you came to Grace Bible Church in the last five weeks and you thought we were going through Jonah, and we were. But that was a little break from Romans, and we're actually making our way through Romans. And so it can give you a chance to become better acquainted with the whole letter rather than being just dropped off in the middle of a path somewhere that we've all been walking for a while. So let's just jump right into our review. I'm going to give you four main kind of review outline points today. Number one is Romans as a whole. We'll just talk about the letter as a whole. And then secondly, we'll talk about Romans 1 to 4. We'll review specifically the four chapters that we've covered so far, and then we'll go and think about some pastoral encouragement from that section. And then fourthly, we'll look at what Romans 5 has to offer us as we step towards that next week, Lord willing. So number one, Romans as a whole. 
Romans is a God-breathed missionary support letter. That's what Romans is. God desired that in his canon of scripture that a missionary letter would occupy prime real estate. A missionary wrote to a church he had never been to before to enlist their support for him as he aimed for untouched regions beyond them. The Apostle Paul is the gospel missionary, and the believers in Rome were the church he desired a relationship with. And at the time of the writing of this letter, it's AD 56, Paul is finishing up his third missionary journey in Acts 20, and while he is in Corinth for about a three-month period of time, that's when we believe he wrote this letter to the Romans. As his third missionary journey was winding down, he was getting ready to take the gift from the Gentile churches and take it back to Jerusalem and give it to the poor church in Jerusalem. At that time, Paul thought of the Mediterranean world he had traversed over the last 10 years over three missionary journeys, and he believed it was time to go west, to Spain, where no one had yet taken the gospel as far as they knew. And Rome's location and and the church in Rome would be the perfect church and location from which to launch that gospel mission. Let's go to Romans 15. I want you to see that this is exactly what Paul tells them in Romans 15, verses 23 and 24. Romans 15, verses 23 and 24. Paul says, but now, remember, he's writing from Corinth. He's like in the heart of the Mediterranean world. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, in other words, over the last 10 years, I've pretty much trekked this territory. And and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you whenever I go to Spain. So he's been thinking on the third missionary journey for a while already about needing to go further away to go to Spain. For many years a longing, I've had this to come to you whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there to Spain by you, believers in Rome, when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Drop down to verse 28. I will go on by way of you to Spain. But before Paul can do this, he needs to make sure that his relationship with the church in Rome was itself founded firmly on the gospel He needs to make sure that they are founded firmly, established firmly on the gospel. And so that means that Paul first had to help them understand the height and the breadth and the width and the depth of the gospel that he preached. So he wrote it out for them, and this is the letter of Paul to the Romans. How could they own Paul's gospel ministry to Spain if they themselves were not in agreement about his gospel that he preached? Now, no apostle planted the church in Rome, and Paul had never been there. He knows many of the believers in the church in Rome. Romans chapter 16 makes that very clear. But it was nevertheless a church without direct influence or direct establishing from any of the apostles. So before Paul partners with them in taking the gospel to Spain, Paul wants to write to them first to make sure the church in Rome knows what the gospel is, And even more importantly, that they are established in the gospel that he preaches. Go back to Romans chapter 1, verse 11. I'll show you the bookends on his letter to the Romans. He's very concerned at the front and at the end that they are established in the gospel. And so everything that happens between chapter 1 to chapter 16 is the gospel and how it establishes the believers. Look at chapter 1, verse 11. Paul says, For I long to see you, Roman believers, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. I want you to be established. And he'll explain here what he means. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both your faith and my faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the um, the rest of the Gentiles. For I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise And to the foolish. So, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to you so that you may be established. I am eager to preach to you, therefore, the gospel. 
Now, the very last chapter of Romans, chapter 16, verse 25, in his benediction at the end, Romans 16, 25, he says, Now to him who is able to establish you, I'm, I'm thinking of the God who is able to establish you, believers, and he has a standard by which God will establish you. Now to him who is able to establish you according to the standard of my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. So Paul is writing to believers. At the very front, he says, you need to be established in this gospel. At the very end, he's praying that the God who establishes sinners will do that by the gospel. Everything in between those pages is the gospel that establishes them. Paul's belief is that in establishing them in this gospel, they will become endeared by the gospel to help him take the gospel to the untouched regions of Spain. And this then is the enduring effect of Romans in your New Testament by God's design. It's amazing that he captures this letter and he freezes it into his scriptures for us for all time. The more you become established in this gospel, the more you will desire to see it go beyond its present boundaries into the lives of sinners who have not yet been savingly touched by it. And so Paul's purpose with this letter might be summarized this way. I'll put it for you up on the screen. You've seen this before. This is Paul's purpose with this letter. The gospel will establish us, and in so doing endear us to the expansion of the gospel. That's the effect in the purpose of this letter. It will establish us and in so doing endear us to this gospel so that we will see it expand. So I just want to ask you off the front, we haven't really talked about what the gospel is, but do you know the gospel? Do you know this good news? It's the good news concerning Jesus Christ and his death at the cross for the salvation of sinners. Do you know the call in the gospel? The the call in the gospel is to turn away from yourself, to turn away from what you've made of your own life, to turn away from your own sin, and to entrust your life to Jesus Christ to save you from God's holy and just wrath against you. Do you know this? But even more importantly, or as importantly, Are you established in this gospel and on this gospel? The the very fact that, that Paul is doing what he's doing in this letter makes it clear that knowing the gospel does not automatically transfer over into being established on it. You need to know the gospel. You need to believe the gospel. But you must also have a letter like this so that it will establish your life in the gospel and on the gospel. Do you know the sufficiency of this gospel to save you from God's holy wrath? Do you know the power of this gospel for salvation to everyone who believes, as Paul says? Do you believe it is solid enough to support you through anything that you will ever face in life? Do you you know that? Do you believe it? Romans is the letter for you, for me, for us. And the effect that it must have on you as it establishes you is this. It needs to have this effect on you You, that you would say, why are there still people who don't know this gospel? How can that be? How can I take it to them at school? How can I take take it to them at work and in my class? How can I help others get trained to go to them a long ways away? That's Romans as a whole. Let's now transition to the specific subsections that we've covered so far in this great letter. Number two, Romans 1 to 4. Let's talk about where we've been, and we'll break it down into the little subsections that we've had. Romans 1, verses 1 to 15, is about the apostle of gospel righteousness. The first 15 verses of chapter 1 introduce us to the apostle Paul. This is his longest introduction in any of his letters, his longest introduction of himself because... He's introducing himself to people he has never been to see. It's true that he knows many people in Romans 16, but he has never been there. And the introduction breaks down into two parts. The first seven verses of chapter one contain something of a formal information um, uh, deposit about himself 
that he could write to really any church anywhere. It's who he is formally. But then in verses 8 to 15 of chapter 1, it contains very personal information about Paul that he could only write and say to the believers in Rome. He, he didn't write these to any other church. He wrote this. This is, this is how he feels for the believers in Rome specifically. And then upon fully introducing himself, Paul lays out the theme of his gospel interest in the letter in verses 16 and 17. You know these. Look at them with me in chapter 1. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man by faith shall live. Paul does something very interesting upon mentioning the gospel. He makes a beeline for the righteousness of God. The gospel reveals the righteousness of God. That's what it said in verse 17. For in it, for, because in this gospel that I'm not ashamed of, I'm not ashamed of it because in it, the righteousness of God is, is revealed. The gospel reveals the righteousness of God in some way in connection with faith, he says right here at the beginning. And what Paul means by this, we'll find out, is whenever a sinner believes the gospel, God's righteousness is revealed through faith in Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew, and it doesn't matter if you're a Greek and you believe. Well, what righteousness of God can be and is revealed where there is faith in Jesus Christ? It's the righteous status that God gives through faith to the one who believes Jesus. It's the righteousness that God declares over the sinner who believes. And this is the great theme and heart of the letter. The righteous status God gives to the sinner through faith and not by works. It gets fleshed out in great detail in chapters 3 and 4, which we just finished covering. And without saying it in verses 16 and 17, Paul is talking about justification by faith alone. The righteousness of God, this is, this is the lion that needs to be let loose. And this is what happened in the Reformation 500 years ago. It'll be fun when we hold the next 500-year anniversary. That'll be cool. The righteousness of God is what Paul loved to see be revealed everywhere and every time any sinner believed Jesus Christ. He wasn't ashamed of this gospel that put the righteousness of God on display over the life of the sinner who believed, which is why I've put in these little subtitles, um, gospel righteousness or something about righteousness in each one. There's a righteousness associated with the preaching of the gospel that gets revealed when sinners believe. And this is driving Paul. The second section is Romans 1, 18 to, verses, uh, to verse 32. And it's about the Gentiles of unrighteousness or the nations of unrighteousness, the, the non-Jews, uh, mankind everywhere. You see, there's the righteousness of God that's associated with the preaching of the gospel and faith, and that's being revealed through the preaching of the gospel. And then there's the unrighteousness of man everywhere. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, just, just of man, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Do you see that flow? From verses 16 and 17 to 18, mankind across every nation is just, he's out there just propagating his own unrighteousness and ungodliness. And the only response that a righteous God can have to that unrighteousness is wrath. And his wrath, he says in verse 18, is being revealed. It is revealed, present tense, right now. So among an unrighteous humanity where God's wrath can only be the only response that's being revealed, the special way that God wants to reveal his righteousness is if those unrighteous sinners believe his son, put their faith in his son. So in that setting, in that kind of setting, God's 
righteousness that's connected with the preaching of the gospel, it will not be revealed among unrighteous men only and until they exercise saving faith in Jesus Christ. And verses 19 to 23 of chapter 1 prove that the wrath of God is deserved. Mankind is truly unrighteous and deserving of wrath. And in verses 24 to 32 in chapter 1, it reveals just how it is that God presently is pouring out his wrath on all of mankind. It's found in the three God gave them over statements, the one in verse 24, the one in verse 26, and the one in verse 28. God presently is handing man over with a judicial hand on the back, shoving him into his prison of wrath. The nations of mankind stand in solidarity, in oneness in this unrighteousness. This indictment is not restricted to a a continent. It's not restricted to a nation. It's not restricted to a gender. It's not restricted to any subsection of humanity. It's just over man, all of us. It's a one-size-fits-all indictment against humanity. That leads us then to Romans chapter 2, to chapter 3, verse 20, and we find there the main idea of the Jews of unrighteousness. The primary argument here in this larger section that Paul is making in, the, in this section here in Romans is that sinners, now get this, don't think that because this is about Jews ultimately or finally by the end that you don't have to listen or that I don't have to because you're maybe not a Jew. Get this. Sinners, in response to hearing the all-encompassing indictment against humanity in chapter 1, tend to want to exempt themselves from that indictment of unrighteousness. I mean, have you noticed this? There's something that wells up within us when a charge of sin or a charge of guilt is ascribed to us in a group. That something wells up within us that believes, no, I'm the exception to that. I'm the exception to that indictment. I should not be included in that indictment. Listen, for those of you kids who are in school, um, there are times uh, when a teacher punishes the whole class because of three knuckleheads, right? You get that? It happens. And boy, does that bug you. That is so unjust. And you, you rightly, if you're not one of the three knuckleheads, um, you rightly want to separate yourself from that group, right? Listen, Romans 1 is not that. It's not that. Man begins to just horizontally compare himself and contrast himself and, uh, with, against others, and he judges others, and he, sinful men just say, well, that guy certainly, he falls under the indictment, and, and I can see that, and therefore, that must put me on some kind of a higher moral ground, so why should I be judged along with him? I see what he is. You see, that's the early part of Romans 2, and it doesn't matter to that guy that he actually in some way, shape, or form does the same things. We seem to have this built-in, unfortunately, built-in light concern or oblivion to how we sin similarly, just like everybody else, but man, are we highly sensitized to other people's sin. There's a splinter in your eye that's just driving me nuts, and I can't see the forest growing out of my own. We think the worst about others, but never ourselves. We think the best of ourselves, but never of others. And so Romans 2 to chapter 3, verse 20, it labors thoroughly and effectively to not let anyone peel himself off away from the unrighteous lump of humanity. The gospel argument starts very generically in verse 2, or in chapter 2, you who have, have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, he doesn't even name a particular subgroup of people. He just says, y'all in general, whoever you are. It starts very generically, broadly, as it deals with protests against this gospel indictment from chapter 1, but Paul leads that argument right into the very center of the Jew's heart by the end. I mean, if any human being thought he had reason to separate himself from the rest of humanity, it would be the Jew. The Jew had privileges galore. 
the sign of circumcision, setting them apart from the Gentile nations. They, the Jews had a special law. The Jew had all of the promises of God through Abraham. The Jews were indeed a special people. That's true. And when Paul preached the gospel from one Jewish synagogue to the next Jewish synagogue over a period of 10 years, and he laid out the indictment of unrighteousness against the mass of humanity, the group of humans who had the most difficulty owning that indictment was the Jews. And Paul labored to show that even the Jews, with all of their privileges from God, they, they could not separate themselves off from the indictment and the guilt of unrighteous humanity. They couldn't. Now, I want you to notice in chapter 3, verse 10, I want you to notice how Paul keeps the world of man from being fragmented off. He won't let anybody through the scriptures pull themselves off in a way. Watch this. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Then he turns it around and says it the other way. All have turned aside. Look at this. Together. There's a lot of togetherness in this humanity. Together they have become useless. There's no one who does good. There's not even one, etc. On down to verse 19. Now watch this in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, and there contextually the law are these Old Testament scriptures that he's just been reading or writing to them. We know that whatever the scriptures say, like what he just wrote, it speaks to those who are under that scripture. And those scriptures are speaking to all of humanity. So scripture has every human being tied up and bound up under its authority. Why? So that, now watch this. He's not letting anybody get fragmented off, right? Watch this. So that every mouth may be closed. So how many mouths will be open before God one day under the word of God at judgment? How many mouths will be open and protests will be given? Not one. And so that, watch this, all the world, how many pieces of the world, humanity speaking wise, will be often separated from this? Nobody. All the world may become accountable to God. You see, the gospel's argument is we are all in this together. There is a one-size-fits-all indictment against us, and not one of us can distinguish ourselves from the rest. There is no distinction the Jew fell under the same indictment of unrighteousness, and he was as guilty as the rest. His privileges, his law, and adherence to laws didn't distinguish himself from the rest of guilty humanity. Well, where does that lead? Or where does that leave the gospel argument at this point in Romans? Paul just led us all down to the bottom of a lead-encased hole of guilt with Teflon-coated walls. You can't burrow your way through the lead-encased wall. You can't burrow your way out of the guilt, and you can't climb your way up out of the guilt because of its Teflon coating. You can't protest down at the bottom. Every mouth is closed. And there you sit. No matter how bad you think you've been, no matter how good you think you've been, there we all sit as one lump, guilty, unrighteous, ungodly, worthy of wrath. And that's where the gospel begins with you, and that's where the gospel begins with me, with this bad news. But then comes the good news. Notice with me next, Romans 3.21 through the end of chapter 4. 3.21 through the end of chapter 4, we'll talk about the faith of gospel righteousness. So what's our hope as we sit in the indivisible mass of unrighteous humanity at the bottom of that lead-encased, Teflon-coated hole? We're silenced. God is prepared to do something that is absolutely amazing. God is prepared in his mercy and in his grace to give what we don't have there and to give what we ourselves can never generate there down at the bottom. He is prepared by his grace to give to us what causes him to rejoice whenever he sees it. Well, what is that? His righteousness. His righteousness. 
That's where the gospel begins with me and with you. We don't have his righteousness down at the bottom of that pit, and we can't generate for ourselves his righteousness there. And, and what would cause him great joy, even looking down on a bunch of ungodly people at the bottom, what would cause to have him great joy would be if he could see his own righteous status there. Our only hope is that even though we have all been unrighteous, that God might see his own righteous status over you, the ungodly one there, the unrighteous one. And then as an actual ungodly, unrighteous sinner, you would have hope then. Well, how does that happen? It happens by, by faith alone. It happens by faith alone, in Christ alone, which is all by his grace alone. And it happens entirely apart from works. Look at verse 21 of chapter 3. I'm just going to read 21 to 26. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. There it is. It's been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus." It's important to understand that the only means of hope, the only means of escape from wrath at the bottom of that pit is faith. There is nothing that has to happen before faith or underneath faith or prior to faith. Biblical salvation makes it clear that there is no attempt that you must make under faith or prior to faith that will then trigger or open the door for justification by faith alone. Rather, while you are still unrighteous in your character, while you are still unrighteous in your practice, as a gift, without any cause within you, God declares you righteous through simple, humble faith in Jesus Christ. And in this section, we learn some of our favorite words. I hope they're becoming some of your favorite words. Justification. It's found in verse 24 and verse 26. That's when God gives his righteous status by means of faith in Jesus. The way it's talked about in chapter 4 is crediting to your account his righteous status where he sees faith. Look at chapter 4, verse 5. But to the one who does not work, keep being an emphasis on that, to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Another favorite word, redemption in verse 24 of chapter 3. That's the ransom payment that Christ made in his blood to ransom us out, to free us from sin's bondage over us. And then there's the word propitiation in chapter 3, verse 25. That's the satisfaction of God's wrath against us through Christ's shed blood. Justification, redemption, propitiation. You want to talk about good works that make salvation possible? It's not your good works and it's not my good works that make salvation possible. There is no such thing. These are the good works of God that make salvation possible for us. Think about this God. God will not give you his righteous status through faith. He will not robe you in his righteous status and yet leave you as a slave to your sin. He won't justify you but not redeem you. You could turn that around. He will not redeem you or free you from your sin which would be really nice, right? And yet leave you unrobed without his righteous status. And he will do neither of those, yet leave himself righteously angry as a judge against you. What an amazing God who saves sinners. And what's the result of this? What's the conclusion? Chapter 3, verse 27. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. 
No one boasts in his salvation. All bragging and boasting by the sinner in salvation is excluded. And there's only one God who saves consistently the same way all of the time, no matter what kind of unrighteous sinner there is. He is utterly consistent in how he saves us all. He doesn't save those really awful, nasty Gentiles one way, but then he kind of has a different way of dealing with the Jews who are his privileged people. He is not that way. He is the one God who is the one way all of the time in salvation. And we tend to think like the Jews did. It's not a Jewish problem. It's a human problem. We we tend to think this way. Well, well, God will be different toward me. Wait till he sees what I've been working on. He'll see how I've distinguished myself from others. That's in us, unfortunately. Unfortunately. And that leads us then into chapter 4, which is the fruit of Paul's preaching of, on justification by faith alone over a 10-year period of time, from one Jewish synagogue to another, to another, to another, and to another. It shows us not just what faith is, it shows us how Paul dealt with unique Jewish-oriented challenges as he preached the gospel. Some of the most severe protests he received and faced came from them. When the Jews protested the gospel's central thrust, which is justification by faith alone in Jesus from Nazareth alone, when the Jews protested the, the, that central th- thrust, Paul answered those protests with his Bible, the Old Testament, and primarily Abraham. This is one of the enduring fruits of Paul's practice that's been frozen in the Bible for us by God. We who believe Jesus by faith alone, we can turn to the Old Testament and see that that's how God has always saved sinners. Look at Abraham. And that increases our confidence in the unity of our Bibles. God did not operate one way towards sinners in the Old Testament, but now he's approaching them differently through the gospel in the New Testament with Jesus. No, the gospel and the Old Testament are on the same team. This is what Romans 4 is all about and what it's always been about. And Romans 4 makes some amazing statements from the Old Testament to prove justification by faith alone, that it has always been God's unchanging way of saving sinners. Let me just remind you of what they were again. First, the Old Testament declares that justification was never through works. That's chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. Justification was never through works. And verse 5 of chapter 4 is key. But to the one who does not work, but to the one who does not work, but believes him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. You see, God never has nor will he ever declare righteous the sinner on the basis that he is, he's reforming his life. That's why God declares me righteous. I'm, I'm working on it. No, it's never been that way. It wasn't that way with Abraham. It's not that way with us. He doesn't justify the self-recovering, the self-rehabilitating. He doesn't justify the one who's trying to overhaul his life. He simply justifies the sinner who actually, practically is ungodly. Do you see that in verse 5? But believes him who justifies the, and swallow that word, ungodly. That's what he does. It doesn't say he justifies the self-reforming. There is no self-work that motivates God to justify. Abraham's the example of this. Secondly, the Old Testament declares justification was never through circumcision. Romans 4, verses 9 to 12. Maybe we could broaden the principle that Paul is zeroing in on for the Jews. Let's broaden it. And to talk about it this way, religious ceremony never governs or regulates when justification by faith can work and be achieved. Justification is in a unique partnership, not with religious ceremony and religious practice and religious tradition. It is in a unique relationship with faith alone. 
Justification by faith alone will never bow to or become the servant under religious ceremony. Justification doesn't sit back and go, oh, I really hope he'll start going to church because then I'll have my day. Or I really hope he gets baptized because then when he gets baptized, I have a chance. Justification does not submit itself under religious ceremony. Anybody's religious ceremony, the Jews or ours. Think about this. If God in the Old Testament did not submit justification by faith alone, even to his God-given ordinance of circumcision for the Jews, then he'll never make something like Christian baptism the trigger that makes justification by faith work. Thirdly, the Old Testament declares that justification was never through law. That's verses 13 to 17 of chapter 4. The main idea here is that adding law to your unrighteous condition is useless for attaining a righteous status that God will accept. Law is useless for justification because of our unrighteous condition. Listen, we're just the wrong kind of people for law to be a means to a righteous status that pleases God. I mean, think about like a, think, think about your, your son coming into the house and he is rolled thick in two inches of mud all over the place and you have just, mom, you've just ironed the white tablecloth and it's really big and you need some help folding it and he runs in and he thinks, I'm going to help. I got something to offer mom. And he runs for you and you're just like, don't even think about it. You are not the right kind of person right now to even help me with what is clean. That's only going to cause problems, and it doesn't endear the child to the mother when he touches it. How much worse is it when we are unrighteous, fist shaking in the face of God people saying, you, you watch what I can do. We are not the right kind of people to be picking up law. Lastly, the Old Testament declares that justification was never for Abraham alone. Verses 18 to 25 of chapter 4. Paul started the chapter with Abraham and he put him forth throughout the chapter. But as the chapter ends, it ends on Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 4, verse 23. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him. Talking about Abraham. But for our sake also, Christians who believe to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. The chapter ends on Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified for us, the one who was raised from the dead for us. He had to be crucified. His blood had to be shed so that there could be redemption right, in chapter 3, so that there could be propitiation, so that through his blood we might be spared from the wrath of God. His death is crucial for our justification, but by the end of chapter 4, he's also talking about how his, just, uh, his resurrection is just as crucial for our justification. The, Paul, uh, the chapter begins with Abraham, but Paul ends with Jesus, and he ends with those who believe him, like Abraham believed God. God started with Abraham to model justification by faith alone, but God was planning way beyond Abraham to those who would hear the preaching of the good news of Jesus Christ and believe him. So let me wrap up our review of what we've said um, even not too long ago here this morning. This is the God who won't free you from your sin, but then leave himself righteously angry with you. He won't redeem you, but fail to satisfy his wrath against you. And the reverse is true. God won't satisfy his anger against you through his son's death, but then leave you still a slave to your sin. And our God won't do both of those amazing things for you, yet still leave you unrobed without his righteous status that pleases him. Do you see everything that God's thinking about in terms of biblical salvation? What you need to be saved, you need to be set free from your sin. You need to be set free from the wrath of God, but he's just, and his wrath must be satisfied in Jesus suffered in the place of those who believe him. And you must be robed in not your righteousness, not in your version of good works that you think you can do. You must be robed in his righteousness. And this is all through faith alone. 
We could say all of that about him, but Romans 4 ends with even adding one more important thing. He is our God who won't do all of that for us through his son's death, but then leave his son in the grave. His son must be raised up. Listen, Jesus had to die for our justification, for our redemption, for our propitiation, but he also had to be raised, verse 25, because of our justification too. So that is where we have been thus far in our exposition of Romans. Thirdly, on our big outline this morning, let me offer you some simple encouragements or exhortations concerning how you can follow this pattern of Paul's unfolding of the gospel as you labor to bring it to your children, to your coworkers, to your classmates, wherever God has you. First, um, like Paul, you have to help people to the bottom of the inescapable pit of sin and guilt and judgment for all. You you have to help them get to the bottom of that indictment. You must make sure that the bad news of the gospel has been made very clear to them sooner than later. Out of the gates, that's what Paul laid out for us, didn't he? Got through the uh, introduction of myself. Here's my main theme of my letter. First thing, what should I talk about? God has a wonderful plan for your life. No, you're, you're at the bottom of a pit and you're in trouble. And wait till you see the wonderful plan that he has for those who trust his son. Put everyone in that lump of humanity, including yourself. Make it as broad as humanity is broad. And then you need to anticipate this, just like Paul anticipated this. Secondly, you know that most people are going to protest that one-size-fits-all indictment. You know that, right? You've experienced it, I know, but, but are you anticipating it? I'm going to tell him what the Bible says. And I think I know what he's going to say. Oh, I'm not like them. You can go into prison and talk, about, talk to people on death row. And they do that. Well, I'm not as bad as him. He killed kids, I, but I didn't. They will make the case that they somehow have distinguished themselves from the rest when, in fact, you know that they are as guilty as the rest. And that's at that point where you actually know more about the sinner than he knows about himself. Not because you're wise and omniscient, but because you are operating with the gospel's knowledge of them and you're just telling them the gospel's knowledge of them. And Paul labored to make sure that no one was able to separate themselves out from the rest of guilty humanity There's something in what Paul is doing that certainly, obviously, is focused specifically and individually on each person's guilt, no doubt. But it appears that it's important for the individual sinner also to see his solidarity with everybody else. I'm I'm as bad as the rest. So first, like Paul, you have to help people to the bottom of the inescapable pit of sin and guilt and the indictment over everybody. Now, how you do that is everything. If you stand at the top and you say, get down there, that's not going to go well. You're not going to have a hearing. But you can hold their hand and slide all the way down and say, this was me. I know. This is really hard to hear, isn't it? It was hard for me. But, But come on, we need to descend a little more. Let's keep going. And then you need to recognize that there's going to be protests. I know, I know. But just listen. And lastly, only when someone is brought clearly into that solidarity under the guilty indictment and he closes his mouth and says, I, 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 I won't protest anymore. I, I actually agree with God. That is the only person who is ready to put faith in Jesus Christ because that is the only person who will stop trying to do good works themselves. Because he's done with himself. He's done with himself. Biblical faith only is operative when the sinner agrees with God in the indictment and the sinner agrees that he's bankrupt and he's got nothing to offer. He has nothing then he's ready to receive the gift that is faith by God's grace. Lastly, this morning, this is where we've been in Romans. Next week, Lord willing, if 
God lets us all come back here together, we will be in Romans 5, and this is where we're going. Let me give you just a preview of Romans 5. Where does Paul lead us next? Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, dot, 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 now he's going to lead us to some conclusions, some great conclusions or results in our lives, uh, our lives as a result of having been justified by faith alone. So, so what can you expect? What can you expect as one who has been justified? Romans 5, 1 to 11 is one of the richest, most encouraging paragraphs of Scripture you'll ever read or that you'll ever study. Let me focus on just one element this morning. Look at the word exult in verse 2. Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Look at verse 3. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, etc. Now drop down to verse 11. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We exult means we make boast of. Um, we make boast in the hope that we now have presently as we live this new life that is ushered forth from justification. And what we have as a result of being justified cannot be squelched by the tribulations that come to us in life. They press in on us and they squeeze us, but we are not without reason still to boast in this great God. And we must boast in our reconciled relationship with God, which was achieved through Jesus Christ when he died. That is just one vein of result or outcome based uh, because of our justification. So listen, what you can expect from Romans 5, especially 1 to 11, is fuel for your worship of God. You will be exulting, having been justified by faith. And then the last part of Romans 5 is staggering. Paul will, will finally treat the subject that we've, as sinners, have been messing up all of the time in our own unrighteous minds. Remember this, we hear all of the encompassing indictment against us, that we are all in guilty solidarity. There is this one-size-fits-all indictment against us, and our unrighteous approach to that is to try to break ourselves off and separate ourselves from the rest of that mass of guilty humanity, to distinguish ourselves, to show at a minimum that we don't think we should be judged with the rest, but especially even more that we should show God how worthy we are to be saved by him. That's what we do in our unrighteousness. We're trying to break ourselves off from the mass, from the lump. And what Paul is finally ready to show us in Romans 5 in the preaching of the gospel is that God has a way that he indeed separates those he saves away from the sinful mass of humanity. But it's not according to our unrighteous thinking. He doesn't do it prior to salvation. He does it in salvation. God is the one who separates us off into a new category, and he does not do it prior to salvation, but in conjunction with our justification, which is by his grace. Look in chapter 5, verse 12, at the lump of humanity. 5.12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. There it is again, all of humanity messed up in Adam Look at verse 15, the first part, the free gift is not like the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one, the many died. Oh, so one guy sins and the many and his, his many in his group die. Look at verse 17, if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one over everybody else that's in him. Verse 18, so then as through the one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. In his category, look at verse 19, as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. This is Adam's group that we were in. This is the lump of humanity at the bottom of the lead-encased, Teflon-coated pit of indictment. Inseparable there, indissoluble union with him. But notice the new category that we belong to having been justified. Look at this new category. This is Christ's group. Look at chapter 5, verse 15. If by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to his many. A new man 
does something for a new category of humanity. Look at verse 16. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from the one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from from many transgressions resulting in justification. There's a free gift that comes to us in this category with Christ. Look at verse 17. Much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. That's a different category of living in that man, Jesus. 18, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men, all of his men. Verse 19, as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Listen, when we were a part of Adam's group, sin reigned over us with death. But now in Christ's group, having been justified, grace reigns supremely over us. Now, look at chapter 5, verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace now in chapter 5 becomes the the operative key word to summarize how God saves sinners with justification by faith alone. Grace separates you off from the old massive lump of humanity, puts you into a new lump of humanity, Christ's people, and grace starts something completely new. You're standing in it, and wait till you see in chapter 6 what it does with your life. So as we head into this next section of Romans, it's going to be fuel for our worship of God. We will exult. We will boast in him. But the last half of Romans 5, you know what it will do? What its effect will be? It will humble us. It will humble us to see how my individual justification by faith has been swept up into the immeasurable, boundless work of God's grace to separate off from the broken, sinful, unrighteous humanity a new humanity in Christ. That's staggering. And my life is, a, is in there, in Christ. You will marvel in chapter 5, at how God so specifically and so individually and so personally gave thought to your salvation by grace. You will, you'll be stunned with that, but you will also marvel at how God did something so much bigger than you. By his grace, through Jesus Christ. Do you know this God of saving grace. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your Bible. Thank you for this letter in the New Testament. Thank you for how it unfolds gospel content that is just staggering. But Lord, we also thank you for that your divine logic in it, your how it should be spelled out, how the content, pieces of content should be laid one right after the next, right after the next. What perfect thought. You know what we're like. You know what we're going to anticipate as we hear an indictment of judgment against us, Lord. You know our pride. You know our, how much we love ourselves and believe that we can do something for ourselves apart from you. You know how we think we in our unrighteousness can convince you, but we can't. Thank you for being a God of grace. Thank you for not waiting for us to figure that out. Thank you for sending to us gospel preachers who have told us that. Thank you for your Bible that tells us that. And now, Father, as we even turn and think in this book, as we study it, as we get to focus on your grace, Lord, may we be stunned once again at a word that is so familiar to us. Give it its full meaning. Bring us back to its intended full and fullness of meaning. May it be like a new word all over once again that helps us to exult in you. Uh, Thank you for your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.